Section 17. Key Kern. The people of the eastern ice, they are melting like the snow. They beg for coffee and sugar. They go where the white men go. The people of the western ice, they learn to steal and fight. They sell their furs to the trading post. They sell their souls to the white. The people of the southern ice, they trade with the whaler's crew. Their women have many ribbons, but their tents are torn and few. But the people of the elder ice, beyond the white man's ken, their spears are made of the narwhal horn, and they are the last of the men. Translation He has opened his eyes. Look. Put him in the skin again. He will be a strong dog. On the fourth month we will name him. For whom, said Amarak, Kudlu's eyes rolled round the skin-lined snow-house till it fell on fourteen-year-old Kotaku, sitting on the sleeping-bench making a button out of walrus ivory. "'Name him for me,' said Kotaku with a grin. "'I shall need him one day.' Kudlu grinned back till his eyes were almost buried in the fat of his flat cheeks and nodded to Amarak, while the puppy's fierce mother whined to see her baby wriggling far out of reach in the little sealskin pouch hung above the warmth of the blubber lamp. Kotaku went on with his carving, and Kudlu threw a rolled bundle of leather dog harnesses into a tiny little room that opened from one side of the house, slipped off his heavy deerskin hunting suit, put it in a whalebone net that hung over another lamp, and dropped down on the sleeping bench to whittle at a piece of frozen seal meat till Amarak, his wife, should bring the regular dinner of boiled meat and blood soup. He had been out since early dawn at the seal holes, eight miles away, and had come home with three big seal. Halfway down the long, low snow passage or tunnel that led to the inner door of the house, you could hear snapping and yelpings, as the dogs of his sleigh team, released from the day's work, scuffled for warm places. When the yelpings grew too loud, Kotaku lazily rolled off the sleeping bench and picked up a whip with an eighteen-inch handle of springy whalebone and twenty-five feet of heavy plaited thong. He dived into the passage, where it sounded as though all the dogs were eating him alive, but that was no more than their regular grace before meals. When he crawled out at the far end, half a dozen furry heads followed him with their eyes, as he went to a sort of gallows of whale jaw-bones, from which the dog's meat was hung, split off the frozen stuff in big lumps with a broad-headed spear, and stood, his whip in one hand and the meat in the other. Each beast was called by name, the weakest first, and woe betide any dog that moved out of his turn, for the tapering lash would shoot out like thonged lightning and flick away an inch or so of hair and hide. Each beast growled, snapped, choked once over his portion, and hurried back to the protection of the passage, while the boy stood upon the snow under the blazing northern light and dealt out justice. The last to be served was the big black leader of the team, who kept order when the dogs were harnessed, and to him Kotaku gave a double allowance of meat as well as an extra crack of the whip. Ah, said Kotaku, coiling up the lash. I have a little one over the lamp that will make a great many howlings. Sarbok, get in. He crawled back over the huddled dogs, dusted the dry snow from his furs with the whalebone beater that Amarak kept by the door, tapped the skin-lined roof of the house to shake off any icicles that might have fallen from the dome of snow above, and curled up on the bench. The dogs in the passage snored and whined in their sleep. The baby boy in Amarak's deep fur hood kicked and choked and gurgled, and the mother of the newly named puppy lay at Kotaku's side, her eyes fixed on the bundle of sealskin, warm and safe above the broad yellow flame of the lamp. And all this happened far away to the north, beyond Labrador, beyond Hudson Strait, where the great tides heave the ice about, north of Melville Peninsula, north even of the narrow Fury and Hecla Straits, on the north shore of Baffin Land, where Barlet's Island stands above the ice of Lancaster Sound 
like a pudding-pole wrong side up. North of Lancaster Sound there is little we know anything about, except North Devon and Ellesmere land, but even there live a few scattered people, next door, as it were, to the very pole. Kalu was an Inuit, what you call an Eskimo, and his tribe, some thirty persons in all, belonged to the Tananirmiat, the country lying at the back of something. In the maps that desolate coast is written Navy Board Inlet, but the Inuit name is best, because the country lies at the very back of everything in the world. For nine months of the year there is only ice and snow, and gale after gale, with a cold that no one can realise who has never seen a thermometer even at zero. For six months of those nine it is dark, and that is what makes it so horrible. In the three months of summer it only freezes every other day and every night, and then the snow begins to weep off on the southerly slopes, and a few ground willows put out their woolly buds. A tiny scone crop or so makes believe to blossom. Beaches of fine gravel and rounded stones run down to the open sea, and polished boulders and streaked rocks lift up above the granulated snow. But all that is gone in a few weeks, and the wild winter locks down again on the land, while at sea the ice tears up and down in the offing, jamming and ramming and splitting and hitting and pounding and grounding, till it all freezes together, ten feet thick, from the land outward to deep water. In the winter Cadlew would follow the seal to the edge of this land ice, and spear them as they came up to breathe at their blowholes. The seal must have open water to live and catch fish in, and in the deep of winter the ice would sometimes run eighty miles without a break from the nearest shore. In the spring he and his people retreated from the floes to the rocky mainland, where they put up tents of skins and snared the seabirds, or speared the young seal basking on the beaches. Later they would go south into Baffin land after the reindeer, and to get their year's store of salmon from the hundreds of streams and lakes of the interior, coming back north in September or October for the musk ox hunting, and the regular winter sealery. This travelling was done with dog sleighs, twenty and thirty miles a day or sometimes down the coast in big-skin women boats, when the dogs and the babies lay among the feet of the rowers, and the women sang songs as they glided from cape to cape over the glassy cold waters. All the luxuries that the Tananimiat knew came from the south, driftwood for sleigh-runners, rod-iron for harpoon-tips, steel knives, tin kettles that cooked food much better than the old soapstone affairs, flint and steel, and even matches, as well as the coloured ribbon for the women's hair, little cheap mirrors, and red cloth for the edgings of deerskin dress jackets. Cadlew traded the rich, creamy, twisted narwhal horn and musk ox teeth, these are just as valuable as pearls, to the southern Inuit, and they in turn traded with the whalers and the missionary posts of Exeter and Cumberland Sounds, and so the chain went on, till a kettle picked up by a ship's cook in the Bendy Bazaar might end its days over a blubber lamp somewhere on the cool side of the Arctic Circle. Kudlu, being a good hunter, was rich in iron harpoons, snow knives, bird darts, and all the other things that make life easy up there in the great cold. And he was the head of his tribe, or as they say, the man who knows all about it by practice. This did not give him any authority, except now and then he could advise his friends to change their hunting grounds. But Kotaku used it to domineer a little, in the lazy, fat, Inuit fashion, over the other boys, when they came out at night to play ball in the moonlight, or to sing the child song to the Aurora Borealis. But at fourteen an Inuit feels himself a man, and Kotaku was tired of making snares for wild fowl and kit foxes, and most tired of all of helping the women to chew seal and deer skins. That supples them as nothing else can, the long day through, while the men were out hunting. He wanted to go into the quaggy, 
a singing-house, when the hunters gathered there for their mysteries, and the angicock, the sorcerer, frightened them into the most delightful fits after the lamps were put out, and you could hear the spirit of the reindeer stamping on the roof, and when a spear was thrust out into the open black night, it came back covered with hot blood. He wanted to throw his big boots into the net with the tired air of a head of the family, and to gamble with the hunters when they dropped in of an evening and played a sort of home-made roulette with a tin pot and nail. There were hundreds of things he wanted to do, but the grown men laughed at him and said, "'Wait till you have been in the buckle, Kotaku. Hunting is not all catching.' Now that his father had named a puppy for him, things looked brighter. An Inuit does not waste a good dog on his son till the boy knows something of dog-driving, and Kotaku was more than sure that he knew more than everything. If the puppy had not had an iron constitution, he would have died from overstuffing and overhandling. Kotaku made him a tiny harness with a trace to it, and hauled him all over the floor, shouting, Ayu, ja, ayu, go to the right. Choi, a, choi. Ja choi o choi, go to the left. Oh, ha, ha, stop. The puppy did not like it at all. But being fished for in this way was pure happiness, beside being put to the sleigh for the first time. He just sat down on the snow and played with a seal-hide trace that ran from his harness to the pitu, the big thong in the bows of the sleigh. Then the team started, and the puppy found the heavy ten-foot sleigh running up his back, and dragging him along the snow, while Kotaku laughed till the tears ran down his face. Then followed days and days of the cruel whip that hisses like the wind over ice, and his companions all bit him because he did not know his work, and the harness chaffed him, and he was not allowed to sleep with Kotaku any more, but had to take the coldest place in the passage. It was a sad time for the puppy. The boy learned too as fast as a dog though a dog's sleigh is a heart-breaking thing to manage. Each beast is harnessed, the weakest nearest the driver, by his own separate trace, which runs under his left foreleg to the main thong, where it is fastened by a sort of button and loop which can be slipped by a turn of the wrist, thus freeing one dog at a time. This is very necessary, because young dogs often get the trace between their hind legs, where it cuts to the bone and they one and all will go visiting their friends as they run, jumping in and out among the traces. Then they fight, and the result is more mixed than a wet fishing line next morning. A great deal of trouble can be avoided by scientific use of the whip. Every Inuit boy prides himself as being a master of the long lash, but it is easy to flick at a mark on the ground, and difficult to lean forward and catch a shirking dog just behind the shoulders, when the sleigh is going at full speed. If you call one dog's name for visiting and accidentally lash another, the two will fight it out at once, and stop all the others. Again, if you travel with a companion and begin to talk, or by yourself and sing, the dogs will halt, turn round, and sit down to hear what you have to say. Kotaku was run away from once or twice through forgetting to block the sleigh when he stopped, and he broke many lashings and ruined a few thongs before he could be trusted with a full team of eight and the light sleigh. Then he felt himself a person of consequence, and on smooth black ice, with a bold heart and quick elbow, he smoked along over the levels as fast as a pack in full cry. He would go ten miles to the seal holes, and when he was on the hunting grounds he would twitch a trace loose from the pitu and free the big black leader, who was the cleverest dog in the team. As soon as the dog had scented a breathing hole, Kotaku would reverse the sleigh, driving a couple of sawed-off antlers that stuck up like perambulator handles from the back rest deep into the snow, so that the team could not get away. Then he would crawl forward inch by inch and wait till a seal came up to breathe. Then he would stab down swiftly with his spear and running line, and presently would haul his seal up to the lip of the ice, while the black leader came up and helped to pull the carcass across the ice to the sleigh. 
This was the time when the harness dogs yelped and foamed with excitement, and Kotuku laid a long lash like a red-hot bar across all their faces, till the carcass froze stiff. Going home was the heavy work. The loaded sleigh had to be humoured among the rough ice, and the dogs sat down and looked hungrily at the seal instead of pulling. At last they would strike the well-worn sleigh road to the village, and Tudukaye along the ringing ice, heads down and tails up, while Kotaku struck up the Ankatevo and Tainai Tainai Tana, the song of the returning hunter and voices hailed him from house to house under all that dim, star-litten sky. When Kotakuk the dog came to his full growth, he enjoyed himself too. He fought his way up the team steadily, fight after fight, till one fine evening, over their food, he tackled the big black leader. Kotuku the boy saw fair play, and made second dog of him, as they say. So he was promoted to the long thong of the leading dog, running five feet in advance of all others. It was his bounden duty to stop all fighting, in harness or out of it, and he wore a collar of copper wire, very thick and heavy. On special occasions he was fed with cooked food inside the house, and sometimes was allowed to sleep on the bench with Kotaku. He was a good seal-dog, and would keep the musk-ox at bay by running round him and snapping at his heels. He would even, and this for a sleigh-dog is the last proof of bravery, he would even stand up to the gaunt arctic wolf, whom all dogs of the north, as a rule, fear beyond anything that walks the snow. He and his master, they did not count the team of ordinary dogs as company, hunted together, day after day, and night after night fur-wrapped boy, and savage, long-haired, narrow-eyed, white-fanged yellow brute. All an Inuit has to do is get food and skins for himself and his family. The women folk make the skins into clothing, and occasionally help in trapping small game, but the bulk of the food, and they eat enormously, must be found by the men. If the supply fails, there is no one up there to buy or beg or borrow from, the people must die. An Inuit does not think of these chances until he was forced to. Kadlu, Kotaku, Amarak, and the boy baby who kicked about in Amarak's fur hood and chewed pieces of blubber all day were as happy together as any family in the world. They came of a very gentle race. An Inuit seldom loses his temper and almost never strikes a child who did not know exactly what telling a real lie meant, still less how to steal. They were content to spear their living out of the heart of the bitter, hopeless cold, to smile all their smiles, and tell queer ghost and fairy tales of evenings, and eat till they could eat no more, and sing the endless women's song, Amna ya ya, Amna a ya a ya, Amna a a through the long lamp-lighted days, as they mended their clothes and their hunting gear. But one terrible winter everything betrayed them. The Tananomiat returned from the yearly salmon-fishing, and made their houses on the early ice to the north of Bylot's Island, ready to go after the seal as soon as the sea froze. But it was an early and savage autumn. All through September there were continuous gales, that broke up the smooth seal ice when it was only four or five feet thick, and forced it inland, and piled a great barrier, some twenty miles broad, of lumped and ragged and needly ice, over which it was impossible to draw the dog sleighs. The edge of the floe off which the seal were used to fish in winter laid perhaps twenty miles beyond this barrier, and out of reach of the Tananomiat. Even so, they might have managed to scrape through their winter on their stock of frozen salmon and stored blubber, and what the traps gave them. But in December, one of their hunters came across a tupic, a skin tent, of three women and a girl nearly dead, whose men had come down from the far north and been crushed in their little skin hunting boats when they went out after the long-horned narwhal. Kadlu, of course, could only distribute the women among the huts of the winter village, for no Inuit dare refuse a meal to a stranger. He never knows when his own turn might come to beg. 
Amarac took the girl, who was about fourteen, into her house as a sort of servant. From the cut of her sharp pointed hood and the long diamond pattern of her white deerskin leggings, they supposed she came from Ellesmere land. She had never seen tin cooking pots or wooden shod sleighs before, but Katuku the boy and Katuku the dog were rather fond of her. Then all the foxes went south, and even the wolverine, that growling, blunt-headed little thief of the snow, did not take the trouble to follow the line of empty traps that Katuku set. The tribe lost a couple of their best hunters, who were badly crippled in a fight with a musk-ox, and this threw more work on the others. Katuku went out, day after day, with a light hunting sleigh, and six or seven of the strongest dogs looking till his eyes ached for some patch of clear ice where a seal might perhaps have scratched a breathing hole. Katuku the dog ranged far and wide, and in the dead stillness of the ice field, Katuku the boy could hear his half-choked whine of excitement above a seal hole three miles away, as plainly as though he were at his elbow. When the dog found a hole, the boy would build himself a little low snow wall to keep off the worst of the bitter wind, and there he would wait ten, twelve, twenty hours for the seal to come up and breathe, his eyes glued to the tiny mark he had made above the hole to guide the downward thrust of his harpoon, a little sealskin mat under his feet, and his legs tied together in the in the tutariang, the buckle that the old hunters had talked about. This helps to keep a man's legs from twitching as he waits and waits and waits for the quick-eared seal to rise. Though there is no excitement about it, you can easily believe that the sitting still in the buckle, with the thermometer perhaps forty degrees below zero, is the hardest work an Inuit knows. When a seal was caught, Katuku the dog would bound forward, his trace trailing behind him, and helped to pull the body to the sleigh, where the tired and hungry dogs lay sullenly under the lee of the broken ice. A seal did not go very far, for each mouth in the little village had a right to be filled, and neither bone, hide, or sinew was wasted. The dog's meat was taken for human use, and Amarak fed the team with pieces of old summer skin tents raked out from under the sleeping bench and they howled and howled again, and waked to howl hungrily. One could tell by the soapstone lamps in the huts that famine was near. In good seasons, when blubber was plentiful, the light in the boat-shaped lamps would be two feet high, cheerful, oily, and yellow. Now it was a bare six inches. Amarak carefully pricked down the moss wick when an unwatched flame brightened for a moment, and the eyes of all the family followed her hand. The horror of famine up there in the great cold is not so much dying as dying in the dark. All the Inuit dread the dark that presses on them without a break for six months in each year. And when the lamps are low in the houses, the minds of the people begin to be shaken and confused. But worse was to come. The underfed dogs snapped and growled in the passages, glaring at the cold stars and snuffing into the bitter wind, night after night. When they stopped howling, the silence fell down again as solid and heavy as a snowdrift against the door, and men could hear the beating of the blood in the thin passages of the ear and the thumping of their own hearts, that sounded as loud as the noise of sorcerers' drums beaten across the snow. One night Katuku the dog, who had been unusually sullen in harness, leaped up and pushed his head against Katuku's knee. Katuku patted him, but the dog still pushed blindly forward, fawning. Then Kadlu waked and gripped the heavy wolf-like head and stared into the glassy eyes. The dog whimpered and shivered between Kadlu's knees. The hair rose about his neck and he growled as though a stranger were at the door. Then he barked joyously, and rolled on the ground, and bit at Kotaku's boot like a puppy. "'What is it?' said Kotaku, for he was beginning to be afraid. "'The sickness,' Kadlo answered. "'It is the dog's sickness.' Katuku the dog lifted his nose, and howled and howled again. 
"'I have not seen this before. What will he do?' said Kotuku. Kadlu lifted one shoulder a little, and crossed the hut for his short stabbing harpoon. The big dog looked at him, howled again, and slunk away down the passage, while the other dogs drew aside right and left to give him ample room. When he was out on the snow he barked furiously as though on the trail of a musk-ox, and barking and leaping and frisking passed out of sight. His trouble was not hydrophobia, but simple, plain madness. The cold and the hunger, and above all the dark, had turned his head, and when the terrible dog sickness once shows itself in a team, it spreads like wildfire. Next day another dog sickened and was killed then and there by Kotaku as he bit and struggled among the traces. Then the black second dog, who had been the leader in the old days, suddenly gave tongue on an imaginary reindeer track, and when they slipped him from the pitu he flew at the throat of an ice cliff and ran away as his leader had done, his harness on his back. After that no one would take the dogs out again. They needed them for something else, and the dogs knew it, and although they were tied down and fed by hand, their eyes were full of despair and fear. To make things worse, the old women began to tell ghost tales, and to say that they had met the spirits of the dead hunters lost that autumn, who prophesied all sorts of horrible things. Kotaku grieved more for the loss of his dog than anything else, for although an Inuit eats enormously, he also knows how to starve. But the hunger, the darkness, the cold, and the exposure told on his strength, and he began to hear voices inside his head, and see people who were not there out of the tail of his eye. One night, he had unbuckled himself after ten hours waiting above a blind seal-hole, and was staggering back to the village, faint and dizzy. He halted to lean his back against a boulder, which happened to be supported like a rocking-stone on a single jutting point of ice. His weight disturbed the balance of the thing. It rolled over ponderously, and as Kotaku sprang aside to avoid it, slid after him, squeaking and hissing on the ice slope. That was enough for Kotaku. He had been brought up to believe that every rock and boulder had its owner, its inuer, who was generally a one-eyed kind of woman thing called a tornak, and that when the tornak meant to help a man, she rolled after him inside her stone house, and asked him whether he would take her for a guardian spirit. In summer thaws the ice-propped rocks and boulders roll and slip all over the face of the land, so you can easily see how the idea of live stones arose. Kotuku heard the blood beating in his ears as he had heard it all day, and he thought that it was the tornak of the stone speaking to him. Before he reached home he was quite certain that he had held a long conversation with her, and as all his people believed that this was quite possible, no one contradicted him. She said to me, I jumped down, I jumped down from my place on the snow, cried Kotuku, with hollow eyes leaning forward in the half-lighted hut. She said, I will be a guide, she said, I will guide you to the good seal-holes. Tomorrow I go out and the tornak will guide me.' 